I normally do the afternoon session, but I wanted to introduce this talk because the next talk is a scientific talk, and as a scientist, I wanted to uh, do the uh, introduction for the scientist who will be giving the talk. Now, remember that scientists have a different view of minerals and specimens than do collectors or dealers or artists. Um, and therefore, in the tradition of the old movie that I loved at one time, Conan the Barbarian, I would like to introduce you to Rossman the Destroyer. <laughs> because he's one of the few people that actually gets away with destroying wonderful specimens in order to identify them. And in order to prove that point, I have here a very rare, the only specimen in the world of a rhombohedral diamond and a tool that's used to help identify it. So George, would you identify, take your piece from this rare rhombohedral diamond? This definitely needs to be studied. But the problem is it's a little big for my machines. Thank you. This is what I need. George Rossman from Caltech, wonderful speaker on color and mold. Oh, thank you very much. Who among us is not enamored with the beautiful color of minerals? This is one of the things that certainly brought me into the science, and I'm sure has brought many of you into the hobby or the sciences, or just general interest. Let's get a little bit into the basics of where color comes from in minerals. Well, clearly, color comes from the way light is absorbed or reflected from or off of minerals. And normally, this is due to metal atoms in the crystal. Ions of various metals cause color. We can also get color due to band gaps, which are things like semiconductors where electrons are mobilized when light hits them. And very often, not only metals act by themselves, but they get together and they form aggregates where the interactions among the metals also can cause color in the minerals. And very importantly, in the pegmatite minerals, the effects of naturally occurring radioactivity, ionizing radiation, is an important aspect of color in minerals. And then physical causes, like um, opal, for example, are also alive. What I want to do is to talk a little bit about each of the first four of these effects, giving you just a little bit of the basics and an insight into the sum of science that we do when we study color in minerals. So let's take a look at the first cause. Metal atoms cause color in minerals. Many of the most beautiful minerals we deal with are the result of metal atoms. So I got to take you into chemistry. Sorry, folks. We got to do chemistry and a little bit of quantum mechanics. If we look at the periodic table, we find that only a relatively small number of the atoms, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, and copper, are responsible for the color in the great majority of the minerals. Sometimes the rare earth elements, cerium, praseodymium, neodymium, come in. Once in a while, uranium is an active component in the color of minerals. And fairly often, sulfur is one of the contributing factors in the color of minerals. And the whole variety of minerals on the bottom show you some examples of minerals that have color due to these various elements. Now let's take first a look at rhodochrosite, one of the more beautiful minerals that we encounter. Rhodochrosite owes its color to manganese. But manganese can occur in different oxidation states. In rhodochrosite, it is manganese in the 2 plus oxidation state. But as we study minerals, we learn that manganese 2 is a very weak cause of color. It takes a lot of manganese to give beautiful color in minerals. And rhodochrosite is almost half of its weight from the manganese oxide, so it has enough manganese to give us the beautiful color. But as Bob Hazen told the audience in a prior year, as the Earth becomes more oxidizing, metal atoms become more oxidized. And if we take a look at manganese in the 3 plus oxidation state, for example, in this hexagonite variety of tremolite, we learn that it takes very little manganese plus 3 to make color. Just a few tenths of a weight percent in the mineral of manganese 3 can cause beautiful color in minerals. 
Whereas in manganese plus two, it takes many, many, many percents of manganese to get that same level of color. And manganese can even be more highly oxidized and cause color. Many of the oxidized manganese minerals, manganese oxides are black, but occasionally we can find them with beautiful color. Here are two examples. Um, kunzite from Ocean View Mine in California, and then the very rare manganese sulfate mineral we see on top with a beautiful green color like we see here. Both of these are due to manganese in the four plus oxidation state. Now I'd like to go a little bit further into some of the things that we have to do to study color in minerals. And I'm going to start with an example we'll hear much more about later today, Favorite Garnet. Favorite is a beautiful variety of Grashutor Garnet. And the question we ask is, where did the color come from? And I think many of us know the answer is from vanadium. So let's take a look at how we address this problem of color in the Savorite garnet. Well, the first thing we have to do is put these samples into a chemical analysis machine. And you don't want just one, you want a variety of them. For example, in the Savorite, I have some that are colored with light colors, medium color, and dark color. I got these from the Bridges family. And when we chemically analyze them, we find there are a whole bunch of different minor elements beyond the normal composition of Grashidar. We find zinc, gallium, germanium, yttrium, zirconium, ytterbium, nickel and copper, and iron, manganese, chromium, and vanadium in all of these garnets. Now we know from the principles of science that zinc, gallium, germanium, yttrium, zirconium, and ytterbium are incapable of causing color in minerals. So we ruled them out. Nickel and copper could cause color, but they're present in the few part per million level at way too low a concentration to cause color. Then we take a look at iron, and we see as the color of the savorite goes from light to dark, the amount of iron remains constant. It is not the cause of the color. In manganese, my gosh, it even goes down in concentration when the color gets darker. That's not where the color is coming from. And we see from the analyses that both vanadium and chromium increase as the material becomes darker. So that tells us that the vanadium and the chromium are potential causes of color. And from studying a lot of vanadium and chromium minerals, we know that they are roughly equally potent in causing color. So because vanadium is a dominant metal, vanadium is a dominant cause of color in the savorite. Now, the green color that we see in savorite, in fact, is typical of the green we see in a lot of different minerals. Here are some examples of vanadium minerals, diopside from Tanzania. They say chrome tremolite from Tanzania, but it's really vanadium, not chromium. And we see titanite again from Tanzania. All of these green minerals owe their cause of color to vanadium in the plus three oxidation state. But to really assert that, we need more than just the chemistry we have to study the color itself. So we put the samples in machines called spectrophotometers, and we measure the absorption of light when it goes upward versus wavelength in these various colors from the infrared through the visible into the ultraviolet. And this particular pattern of light absorption that we see here in titanite in two different crystal orientations is a very diagnostic pattern of vanadium so we know, in fact, that vanadium is a dominant cause of the titanite and the other minerals in the savorite as well. So it's chemistry and spectroscopy we need to study color. Now, there are other minerals that have color that is green, but not necessarily due just to vanadium. For example, chromium. Who has not seen a beautiful green emerald? This is due to chromium. There are green amphiboles. There's green spodumene, the hiddenite variety. Green pyroxenes, garnets, and tourmalines, and many, many, many other minerals that are green, all of which are due to chromium. Chromium, in fact, in the plus three oxidation state. So you may assume that all minerals contain chromium plus three would be green. No, some of them are red. Um, yeah, ruby is red. I think we saw that earlier today that ruby can be red. In fact, that's by definition what ruby is, red corundum. Is that the only example of red? No, when I was in Myanmar, I picked up these beautiful spinels. And they're also red, and they're also due to chromium. Red, green, green, red. What's going on? We got a problem here. So 
this is the sort of thing I like to address. I like to address these problems about the origin of color. And now I got to take you into the realm just at the edges of quantum mechanics, people. We got to look at the electrons that are inside the atoms because it is the electrons that are causing the color ultimately. Those of you that may have remembered chemistry learned that electrons reside in these volume loops, going on here, called orbitals. And in the orbitals, there's a certain volume in which particular electrons occupy. And three of the electrons occupy orbitals where, where the oxygen atoms are. The electrons sneak between the oxygen atoms. They, they go right between them. But there are two orbitals where the electrons collide with the oxygen atoms directly, head-on collision. And in these two orbitals upstairs here, we have the electron charge on the oxygen, which is negative, repelling the electron charge of the electrons. And two of them have this repulsion that takes a lot of energy to overcome, where three of the orbitals sneak between the oxygens and take a lot less energy. And we can diagram that on a diagram that shows on an energy scale, we have three lower energy orbitals and we have two higher energy orbitals. And chromium in the plus three oxidation state, that's our ruby, has three electrons that are naturally going to go in the lowest energy position, the three lowest orbitals. Now, if we shine light on the sample, we're going to move electrons. and We're going to force one of the electrons to jump upstairs to the higher energy orbital. But that is going to take a lot of energy to overcome the repulsion. So the energy of the light is what's necessary to drive that electron upstairs. And because we are in this repulsive situation, it's going to take a fair amount of energy to make that happen. Now, with this principle at hand, we can begin to understand why ruby is red and emerald is green. The difference is that in the corundum structure and in the spinel structure, the distance between the oxygen and the chromium atom here at the center is relatively short compared to the distance between chromium and oxygen in the tourmalines in the garnet. Because the oxygen is further away in the garnet and the tourmaline, it takes less energy to overcome the repulsion because the oxygen is further away. It doesn't repel as much. But in the tightly packed structure of corundum and spinel, the oxygen is very close to the chromium, and that poor electron needs a lot of energy to overcome that repulsion, so it takes a more energetic light to make that electron move. And we can measure that quantitatively in our spectroscopies. We put the samples in the machine, and we find on an energy scale, ultraviolet light and violet light has a lot more energy than red light. And my gosh, chromium in ruby, the red color, absorbs light at a higher energy than in the green minerals. Now, it's not where the light is absorbed that's important. It's where the light is transmitted that makes the color. And we see as we look at the transmission window where light is not absorbed, it's at higher energy in ruby. It's in the region where the human eye is not very sensitive, sort of in the deep blues and into the violets. So most of the light that we see in a ruby is coming through here that corresponds to the red, and that's why ruby is red. But in the longer distances between the metal and the oxygen, we move this absorption to lower energy and the transmission window moves to lower energy, and that's in the green, and that's why emeralds are green. So we can understand at a very technical level from theory, from quantum mechanics, and from measurement why these minerals have different color. That's theory. Wouldn't it be nice if somehow we could take a mineral and experimentally make this oxygen chromium distance change in the lab? What if we could take a sample and stretch it apart so the actually we move the atoms further away. We can do that. When we heat a crystal, the crystal expands and the oxygen moves further away from the chromium. So I'm going to take a sample of a green, or sorry, a red chrome pyrope from a deep diamond mine. And we're going to heat it up in a furnace. We're going to see what happens to the color when we expand the crystal at high temperature. We're going to move the oxygen atoms further away from the chromium and let's see what happens. Here's a little movie. Cold, hot. Cooling back down, it turns red. Warming back up, it turns green. Exactly like our theory would have predicted. You can do this on a high temperature hot plate at home. You can see these chrome pyropes change color. Some minerals don't move quite as far as that when they're heated, but all of them, when they're heated, all of the red chromium minerals 
move to lower energy, moving towards the green, maybe not all the way there. Okay, that's what we can do with single metals. But even more importantly, in a lot of minerals, it's when metals get together and interact with each other that we have color that is even different from the metals all by themselves. And one of my favorite minerals is tourmaline, so let's take a look at that. The beautiful pale blue tourmalines that we see, or even the darker blue ones, are often just due to iron in the 2 plus oxidation state all by itself. Only iron, nothing else. But if we add a little bit of titanium to the mineral, just a fraction of a percent titanium, they turn green. Iron plus 2 and titanium gives green. Iron by itself is blue. And what's happening here is that when you put iron and titanium next together and shine light on it, we move an electron from the iron over to the titanium. Iron is oxidized, titanium is reduced. That process takes energy. It takes a lot of energy to happen, and that changes the color of the mineral. And that is why we have green tourmalines. And this process is probably the most important process of causing color in common rocks. Granites, basalts, all of them owe their dark color when you see dark minerals to this process between either iron interacting with iron or iron interacting with titanium. All the dark micas, the amphiboles, the pyroxenes, they are dominated by this interaction of iron with titanium and iron interacting with iron. And Hyanite and cordierite and corundum and all sorts of beautiful other minerals are again low concentrations of these things causing the beautiful colors and the minerals we've come to know and love. And the exact color depends upon the structure whether we share edges with two oxygens between the metal atoms or if we share faces with three shared oxygens. That's going to modify the color between greens and blues. But this is the general process that many of the beautiful minerals occur. Now, let's get to some of the heavyweights here. Radiation. The world is naturally radioactive. There's uranium and thorium in the ground, and much more importantly, there's potassium in the ground. Potassium is a very common element. But a small amount of potassium is naturally radioactive, and it gives off gamma rays when it decomposes. So let's take a look and see what radiation does to minerals. Zircon is a beautiful example. So let's talk a little bit about the radiation effects in zircon and what it does to the color. In Sri Lanka, a lot of the zircons come out of the ground of the sort of brownish orange color, sometimes called hyacinth color. But many, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, people learned that if you take these brownish red zircons and heat them up in a charcoal fireplace or wrap them in rice bread and heat them, Many of them will turn blue, like the ones on the top of the photograph. Now, why does this happen? Why do we get these color changes taking place in zircon? And this has to do somewhat with the radiation. Zircon is zirconium silicate. And the chemical element zirconium in the plus 4 oxidation state is roughly the same size as the uranium ion as it occurs in nature. So almost all zircon incorporates a small amount, sometimes a large amount, of uranium in its structure when uranium replaces zirconium. But uranium is radioactive. It has a half-life of around 4 billion years. And as it decomposes through radioactive decay, it bombards the zircon from within with all these different forms of energy, alpha particles, electrons, gammas, and broken fragments of atoms. And the energy of these decomposition products can cause color. And here's how it happens. Let's take a gamma ray. When the gamma ray comes shooting through the crystal, it can come in the vicinity of an electron on an oxygen atom. And the electrostatic energy of the gamma ray is immensely greater than the energy by which an electron is bound to an atom of oxygen. So when the gamma ray comes shooting by, it can literally strip the electron off of the oxygen atom leaving the oxygen electron deficient and making the electron go bouncing through the crystal, slowing down, hitting atoms, until it finally comes to rest somewhere within the crystal. So where do these electrons end up? Well, many places, but here's one of the places. There's no such thing as a perfect crystal in nature. All of our crystals have defects in them at the atomic level. And one of the common defects is where an atom is missing in this little cartoon 
a negative ion is missing in the crystal structure. This happens quite commonly in crystals. Well, look, we have an electron with a negative charge bouncing through the crystal, being ejected by the gamma ray, looking for a place to call home. Where does the electron go? It goes where the missing atom is. We call these things color centers because electrons trapped in a charged site in a crystal are capable of absorbing light and causing color. Now, I need to present this on a little more technically sophisticated level to really get the idea across. So let's take another look at this idea about these electrons being trapped and see if we can understand more technically what's going on. The electron really belongs down here, but it got promoted and it fell down into a trap. And there that poor electron is in that trap. And every time light comes by, the electron jumps up with excitement and it absorbs the light causing color, but it can't get out of that trap. We call these things color centers, or in the German, F center for Farbe, color center in German. Now, that causes color. That is the red-brown color in the zircon. But how do we explain the blue color in zircon? Well, technically speaking, I think I can get into this a little bit like this. If you apply enough energy, you can drive the electrons out of the trap. That's what the furnaces do. And the electron goes back home. And then when the electron gets back home, the blue color we see is the color of the uranium in the zircon, not due to the color centers. So there are many, many, many different minerals that have color related to things like this. And a lot of these are pegmatite minerals, one of the things I dearly love. Let's take a look at one example of a pegmatite mineral where radiation plays a part in the color. And maybe I can give you a little bit of insight to some of the complexities of these radiation colors. Who in the world does not love the beautiful color of Amazonite feldspar? It's just gorgeous blue color. But feldspar comes in a variety of colors. And three of them I want to touch upon briefly today are the microcline that has the blue Amazonite color, the yellow color of a lot of the common plagic places like the Oregon stone and the stuff from Mexico, and the smoky color that we see in some of the sanadines, smoky feldspar, not as commonly encountered, but very pretty nevertheless. So the question I have to ask as a scientist, if we had textbook perfect, chemically pure, ideal feldspars, what color would they be? We look at the chemistry of the feldspars, and we see they have calcium, barium, aluminum, potassium, all these different chemical elements. And these are the chemical formulas of the feldspar. But every one of those components in the textbook ideal feldspars is incapable of causing color. Theoretically, I would expect pure end-member feldspars to be absolutely colorless. How do we test that? Well, we get some. We look at them. And there they are, a whole series of different end-member feldspars, chemically pure. And all of them are colorless, as we would expect from the theory. So where does color come from in feldspar? It can't be due to the ideal components. It has to be other minor components. In the case of the yellow feldspars, like some of the sunstones and whatnot, the sanadine from Madagascar, the color comes from iron. And it comes primarily from iron in the oxidized 3 plus oxidation state. All of these feldspars, the yellow color, is due to a little bit of iron replacing the aluminum in the feldspar. Now, again, we know this because we take spectroscopy. A feldspar is a low symmetry crystal. We need to take the spectrum in three different directions in the crystal to get all the possible responses. But we see in the visible portion of the spectrum, iron plus three is absorbing the violets, the blues, and into the greens, letting the yellows and the reds come through that gives us that orangey yellow color. There's also iron plus two in most common feldspars. But that absorbs light in the infrared portion of the spectrum, where we, the human observer, cannot see it. Very strong absorption, but it's excellent that it does, because when people do remote sensing of Mars, for example, with satellites orbiting Mars and looking down, measuring the spectra of Mars, it's from the absorption here in the infrared that we know we have feldspars on Mars. So even though it doesn't contribute to the color that we enjoy, it's certainly very technically important that we have these light absorptions in the infrared. But let's come back to amazonite, the blue, beautiful colors of amazonite feldspar. 
What's going on here? Well, the first thing I have to do is do chemistry. And we do chemistry, we find that every single blue or bluish green amazonite feldspar that anybody has ever looked at contains a small amount of lead as a minor component in the feldspar. So you might jump, jump to the immediate conclusion that lead makes the color. But the trouble is there are some feldspars that have lead in them, like this white area here, where there's no color at all, even though we have a lot of lead. So what's going on? Life has to be more complicated than just lead. On the other hand, there is no amazonite that does not have lead. Well, the next thing we have to do is we have to look at the spectroscopy a little bit further. If we go into the infrared portion of the spectrum, we find that all amazonites that are blue contain water. And we see that in the infrared spectrum. The absorption out here in the invisible portion of the spectrum tells us there's water molecules, H2O, inside the feldspar. And if we take a look at the lead-containing feldspars that are not beautiful blue color or green, they basically don't have any water at all or just tiny, tiny traces of water. So somehow we have to conclude that both water and lead are part of the process that gives rise to amazonite color. Now, if we go into the lab and get some bottles of lead chemicals and look at them, they're colorless, like lead nitrate right here, no color whatsoever. This is lead in the plus two oxidation state, the common oxidation state of lead. And how can this cause color in feldspar, even in associated, it can't, even with water. So something else is going on. So to look at the possibilities that something else is involved, the first thing I do is I take a little piece of amazonite feldspar and I say, let's heat it up like we did with the zircon and see if anything changes. One minute at temperature, they go colorless. And this is an indication that is very possibly due to radiation. Most radiation colors fade away <clears throat> when you heat them up at high temperature. It doesn't prove it yet. So what I have to do now is take my big bundle of radiation I have back at Caltech and put the feldspar inside a source of radiation and irradiate it in a week with the amount of radiation it might get in nature in 100 million years and see what happens. This is what happens. I get the color back again with radiation. And sometimes if I give it more radiation, I make it even darker blue than it was to begin with. I can enhance the natural color by giving it a greater dose of radiation than nature gave it itself. The radiation is from the potassium in the feldspar. This is potassium feldspar. Small amount of potassium is naturally radioactive. If you had a banana today, you ate a little bit of radioactive potassium. The amount of radiation is extraordinarily feeble. Very hard to detect with the Geiger counter even. But if the feldspar sits for 100 million years, getting these feeble doses of radiation, it builds up over time. And this is the result, beautiful blue amazonite feldspar. Now what we know is going on is that when the radiation hits the water molecules in the feldspar, it splits the water apart into these little things we call free radicals, H and OH, each of which have a free electron on them. And that OH radical is an incredibly strong oxidizing agent, and it's capable of oxidizing the lead to lead plus three. And it is the lead plus three in the feldspar which is the cause of the color of the amazonite feldspar. But without the water in the feldspar, this process cannot happen, and all the radiation in the world is not going to oxidize the lead. It takes the water as the catalyst to make it happen. Radiation also is a cause of color in smoky feldspar, the beautiful sanidines from the Eiffels. Um, they are another feldspar that will fade when you heat it up, a very strong indication of radiation-induced color. In fact, if you go out and look at ordinary granites, you'll typically see the plagioclase feldspars are a little bit lighter color than the potassium feldspars, because basically all potassium feldspar in nature has just a little bit of innuendo of smoky color to it, and appears slightly darker than the plagioclase feldspars. What's going on here is very similar to what we have in smoky quartz. Both quartz and feldspar, well quartz is a minor component, has aluminum in it, maybe 100 ppm or so. Aluminum is a major component of feldspar, but when a gamma ray comes through and hits this aluminum impurity in these minerals, it can strip an electron away, changing the charge around the aluminum, 
and that makes another color center, and is that radiation damaged aluminum center, which is the cause of the smoky color, both in the feldspar and in smoky quartz. Well, let's talk about quartz a little bit more. Here's the Manakara amethyst, the so-called grape felsedony. It's amethyst, all right. When I work with this in the lab, I put little pieces in the furnace, and guess what they do? They lose their color completely. Maybe radiation, we'll worry about that later. Another quartz I picked up when I went to the Anae Ametrine mine in Bolivia. They mine a lot of ametrine, but there was colorless quartz littering the ground in the vicinity of the ametrine mine. I recognized immediately this was amethyst that had been bleached by the sun. Sunlight can take the color away from radiation damaged minerals, and all of this colorless quartz they had on the top of the ground was amethyst that had been bleached out of its color by exposure to sunlight. So, why do we think amethyst is radiation color? Well, you go to Russia where they're making synthetic amethyst, and you find that when the amethyst is produced, this is the ametrine, which is both citrine and amethyst, the area that will become amethyst when it's first grown is absolutely colorless. It contains iron, which is the minor component in amethyst, but they have to expose it to gamma radiation to oxidize the iron with the gamma rays, and then it turns into amethyst. So I did the same thing with the Manakara, the grape chalcedony. I did the same thing with the material I picked up in Bolivia. When I exposed them to gamma rays, the amethyst color comes back. And if I give it a lot of radiation, it even comes back with a darker color than it was naturally found in the ground. Because in the lab, I can give it hundreds of millions of years of dose in a short time, where nature may have only acted for a few tens of millions of years. <clears throat> So, many of the pegmatite minerals, tourmaline, kunzite, some of the apatites, and a whole variety of others, danberite, and so on, owe their color to ionizing radiation, a major, major source of color in the minerals that we all have come to know and love. But there's another cause of color that's important in a few minerals, and this will be the one I'd like to bring forth, and this is inclusions in minerals. By inclusions, I mean foreign phases that are present in the host mineral. And this beautiful example of a star appearance in rose quartz is an example of exactly what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, I get to destroy things. I get to destroy rose quartz. Not this one in particular, but I'll take rose quartz and I'll crush it up and make a powder out of it, a coarse powder. And then I'll soak it in hydrofluoric acid that dissolves the quartz and makes a gas, silicon tetrafluoride, which goes away and after I wash whatever is left over, I end up with these mats of insoluble residue that notice have the same color as the rose quartz. The mats are less than 1% by weight of the original rose quartz. And if the rose quartz was a deep rose color, I get a rose colored mat left over after I dissolve the quartz. And if it's sort of a more of a purpley rose quartz, I get a more of a purpley blue mat left over. Whatever this material is that is insoluble in the acid is the cause of color of rose quartz. It is not the quartz itself. When we look at these things under the electron microscope, we find these beautiful mats of hair, almost like human hair. And the more we magnify them, the more we realize that this fine fibrous mat, which is the rose color, is the material that's important. And here's a false transmission electron from a microscope image, showing that many of these fibers are just a few hundred nanometers in size, much less than the wavelength of light. And this material is a material, an aluminoborosilicate, somewhat related to dumortierite, but a slightly different structure than dumortierite. And that is the cause of color in all the rose quartz we have looked at for many, many localities around the world. Rose quartz is not rose because of quartz, it's rose because of these fibers. Well, the final thing I'd like to talk about briefly is this concept of band gaps. Band gaps are something familiar to people that work with semiconductors. Band gaps are something that happens when light hits a material and then drives electrons into what we call a conduction zone where electrons freely conduct throughout the crystal. And a few of our minerals do that. Here are two examples I show you. I show you cinnabar and I show you orpiment. And the thing about band gaps is that we have a region in the, inf in the infrared 
coming towards the visible, where these minerals transmit light with very little absorbance. When the pen trace goes up, they're absorbing light. Here we have transmission, 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 transmission. Then very suddenly, it begins to absorb light with extreme efficiency as we drive these electrons into the conduction band. And depending upon the energy that it takes to drive those electrons through the conduction, we get different colors. In cinnabar, we notice the band gap happens right here at the edge of the red, so only the red lights make it through. Cinnabar is red. With orpiment, we get more of the yellows and the greens mixed together, and all of these things kind of mix together in the human eye to make sort of an orangey color. But again, particularly sulfides and tellurides and some of the sulfur salts behave this way and have that as the cause of the color. So hopefully we can get a few take-home exam or ideas today from what we talked about. A lot of the minerals, particularly the ore minerals, the coppers and chromium and things like that, owe their color to metal atoms, primary metal constituent, which part, is part of their primary chemical composition. In many cases where we have oxidized minerals, things that form as the earth became more oxidizing, we have minor amounts of these metals in many of the silicate minerals in particular that we deal with, but it's the highly oxidized minerals, manganese, chromium, vanadium, iron, and other things that cause beautiful color in minerals. And then, importantly, in a lot of the pegmatite minerals, radiation is an important cause of color in many of the minerals that we come to know and like, pink tourmaline, for example, and the other examples I showed today. So of the roughly 5,300 minerals that are known to exist today, believe it or not, only about 400 of them have been exactly examined for causes of color. So I guess for people in my work, there's still job opportunities in the future. But I can say this kind of brings me to the end. But if you have questions about this, I'll be happy to talk with you during the breaks afterwards or during the dinners and discuss color in your favorite mineral. And if you have samples you want to give to me, like this beautiful sample that I had here earlier, I'll be more than happy to consider looking at their causes of colors as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.